Believe it or not, you young guys, there was a day before the media age and social media age. And um, I've, as I've clarified over the last few weeks, we're not anti-media. Um, we just want to make sure that we are honoring God and we're involving him in the process of what is so normal for our culture. What would he do? How would he act? How would he feel on the inside? And this is good for us to ponder. And we, we get glimpses of, of different things as we look through the book of John. And so last week, Madeline focused on how, how secure Jesus would be if he had social media. That he would be secure in his identity. He would not be chasing after the approval of man, but he would be just satisfied in the approval of God. And he would not be bombarded with comparison, comparing himself to others. He would be content knowing um, who he is and what God's called him to do. And so great job, Madeline, last week. is awesome. So this week, you guys get to hear from Jeremy B.R., we're going to go a little more in-depth into looking at the book of John. I'm thinking about a few things that Jesus would do. So you guys help me welcome up Jeremy B.R. Take it away, bro. Hey, I need your help. Yeah, I preach from up here. Thanks. What's up, guys? My name is Jeremy. I'm excited to preach this morning, y'all. Seriously, I'm coming a little bit spicy this morning, okay? I know you're thinking, man, Mitchell's the tall one, Jeremy's short. We just, he, we just cuddle with Jeremy, you know, but I'm, I'm coming in with some spice, okay? Because I've seen some spice on some of y'all's social media feeds, okay? So I'm not, I'm not trying to come in hard. I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to level with you, okay? I'm just trying to get to y'all's place, okay? I was talking with a good co- uh, friend from college yesterday night because he randomly called me, and he said, what did he say? I've got the littlest big man pants you've ever seen. So there you go. I've got my big man pants on today, but I'm 5'5". Five five. I'm coming in. So, so, yeah, last week Madeline talked about social media and, and basically how if Jesus had social media, social media would not have had Jesus. His heart would have been free, and he would have been true to himself. This week I'm going to talk about how would he use social media? If he had it, why would he have it? What would be his priorities? And as Madeline already clarified, we don't really know, okay? Like, he didn't have Facebook, okay? Like, we don't know if he lived today, would he have social media or not? Which platforms would he use? For what purposes would he use them? But we do know at least some things about Jesus. Would we agree? We know some things about Jesus. We know some things about what he prioritizes, how he behaved, some relationships in his life. Okay, hopefully I haven't already lost you. Okay, so this is not a personal soapbox. This is not Jeremy trying to create new rules on social media usage. This is, let's look to Jesus and let's just consider. Let's just consider Jesus in this area of our life of social media. And if you want my hot take, Here is the hot take. If Jesus has social media, he would be promoting God instead of self, forgiving people, not judging them, and a light rather than a shepherd. If Jesus has social media, he would be promoting God instead of self, forgiving people, not judging them, and a light rather than a shepherd. So I'm going to expand on each of these. If you're already stressed, don't worry. We're going to go into our Bibles. If you want to open to John 8, that's where we're going to start. The past seven days of the media fast have coincided with us reading John 8 through 14, so that's primarily where I'm going to preach from this morning. But before I jump in, I want to share a few snippets from my Facebook feed of old, okay? I used to have a Facebook account back in 2010, 2011, it's probably when I got it, and then I deleted it somewhere around right after I got married, and had, I just went AWOL for a few years, crazy. Um, But before I deleted my old Facebook, I created a Google Doc where I I, uh, savored some of my best captions. I scrolled through my walls like, is there anything really worth saving here from my past four years in social media? And so just want to give you all a glimpse. We'll start with uh, 10 years ago, Jeremy, about a year into his relationship with God. He He had something meaningful to share, okay? No, I don't like pain. I like relieving it. No, I don't like struggle. I like overcoming it. No, I don't like fear. I like conquering it. I don't like bad things, but I wouldn't know good without them. Y'all, I've been spicy since day one, okay? Look at that fake Blackberry. Y'all remember those? That's a Pantech slate right there. 
Here's, here's a personal milestone for y'all. Dean told me today that I need to shave. Manhood achieved in my pink glasses. Okay, I went to private school. We had to keep a clean shaven face. I worked the entire senior year for this April 24th comment in the hallway because my peach fuzz had gotten reflective enough of the sunlight that he was like, hey, you got to get that off. And I said, yes, I do, and I shaved. Here's some, some unashamed zeal, freshman year of college. This is how we all start our Facebook post, right? Ha, 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 Jesus, let's go. And then I shared a testimony. I didn't uh, include the whole testimony on this snippet, but just figured if you're looking for a new way to start your post, you can just, you can steal that one. Ha, 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 all caps, Jesus. And let me set the stage before you show this last one, Connor, okay? So freshman year of college, Everyone's just the same feed. I just see it again and again and again. One more week until summer. One more week until we finish freshman year. Wow, it's amazing. I'm just like, this is getting lame. And if you know me, I have a hard time just doing what apparently everyone is supposed to do on any given day or week of social media. So I was like, let me pretend like I'm participating, but add a little bit of something to it, okay? So I say, guys, just one more week until you guessed it. I can say I went the entire school year without ever washing my bed sheets or bath towels. Hashtag holla. That is true, guys. That's, that's freshman year. I have come a long way. I'm married. We've got clean bath towels. It's amazing. Y'all, the last month of my freshman year, I slept on my tile bathroom floor because my bed smelled so bad. And I still didn't wash the sheets. Mm. So if this doesn't show you how obviously valuable social media is to our life, I mean, I don't know what will, okay? Are y'all in John 8? We're going to John 8. Back to the regularly scheduled programming here. Prom okay, so if Jesus had social media, he would be promoting God instead of self. I'm not saying you need to humiliate yourself like I did freshman year, but Jesus would be promoting God. This one goes really hand-in-hand hand with what we talked about last week, of uh, just Jesus emphasizing his relationship with his father, doing what his father's doing, living for his father's approval. And really simply, in John 8, 50, Jesus says, I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. So Jesus did not seek glory for himself. Rather, he seeks to glorify his father. He doesn't promote himself. He doesn't glorify himself. But he did desire glory, so it's not like even that desire is wrong. Three verses later in verse 53, the Jews are offended at Jesus being kind of bodaciously arrogant about how awesome he is. He makes these bold claims about his ability to give eternal life. And the Jews say, are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Y'all ever see someone's post and think to yourself, who do you think you are? I have thought that. So when my friends unfollow me, I'm like, hey, who do you think you are, man? I thought we were friends. Jesus replies, he says, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim is your God, is the one who glorifies me. He was not very bashful in his reply. <laughs> but the differentiator is where his glory comes from. Jesus knew his judge, and he knew that any glory he received would come from the Father, not from man's opinion to him. Pretty simple, right? Basically the same thing we talked about last week. Simple stuff. So let me ask you a super Sunday school question, and you can actually give me your best guess at the answer. As a follower of Jesus, who or what is your life primarily about? Any guesses? Any Sunday school guesses? Me, of course. That was the wrong answer. As a follower of Jesus, your life is primarily about Jesus. He is the one we are living for, right? Easy. Now think about your feed. If someone were to just glaze through your feed's history, what or who would your life be primarily about? And is it the same answer? If not, why not? It's a good question to ponder, right? You're not mad at me personally, right? I'm not against you personally, right? I'm just asking a question, right? Okay, cool. So in John 12, can you open this and hand it to me? Thanks. Y'all, Mitchell's a baller. One day he's going to, thanks. 
one day he's going to let us watch his high school fadeaway basketball three-pointer shot. It's amazing. Um, win the game. Time expiring. Donald Mitchell's a baller. Okay. So why wouldn't our answers match? There could be a lot of reasons to that, but one potential reason we see in John 12, Jesus had just done some amazing things, and some people didn't believe in him, but it says there are many Jews who did believe in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith. In other words, they would not publicly declare their belief in Jesus. Why? For fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. Isn't that crazy? So we live in a different society, different social structure. Okay, but I think we would all agree our culture, our friend group, our family friends, our literal family we grew up in, it does not live primarily just to promote God. And in a sense, if we publicly confess Jesus, if we are very open about our love for Jesus, our thankfulness for Jesus, our belief in Jesus, we would be put out. Whether it's losing social status, losing respect, losing influence, even the American Christian culture could put you out if you say something that's not in the mainstream of what you're supposed to say as an American Christian. But God's the one we exist to promote, not ourselves. And so how did Jesus go about promoting God instead of self? John 12, 49 through 50, Jesus says, For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. Y'all repeat that, and how to say it. That's crazy. The Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his command leads to eternal life, so whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. I don't know about y'all, but I don't think that would change if Jesus had social media. I think he would say what the Father told him to say. And I think there's an invitation for us to step into there. This passage in John, John 12 brings me to my second theme, which is that if Jesus had social media, he would be forgiving people, not judging them. Okay, so if you're in John 12, check out two verses earlier. Jesus says, As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. Wait, so you mean people that knew what to do and didn't do it? Wait, people that heard the words of Jesus and consciously rejected him? What did Jesus do? How did he respond? As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. I know for me, it is easy to enlist myself in the social media police force, accusing and labeling and judging and cornering those that I disagree with, and I think that I'm being the truth in love. I think that I'm protecting God's people from corruption. I think that I'm reaching the lost, but if I am judging the world, if I'm judging the lost, then I'm not the voice of Jesus. If you don't believe me yet, flip back to John 8. Okay, the very beginning, verses 3 through 5. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? Let me pause. Does this sound like anyone else's social media feeds have ever sounded? Look what this person did 20 years ago. Look what they said. I can't believe they said such and such. I can't believe he said that. She voted for him. He's associated with those people. So-and-so is a communist. So-and-so didn't get the vaccine. Can you imagine? And then we put them in the spotlight. We put them before the people, put them before the group called the Internet. And we say, now what do you say? What do you say? And if the accused person decides not to respond to comment to the 19th news article writing about the same narrative. That's it. They're guilty. Didn't reply. Oh, guilty. If they were innocent, they would have defended themselves against the Sanhedrin called the Internet. But how did Jesus respond to that question? Now, what do you say? At first, nothing. But as we see in verse 7, it says, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone. 
And a few verses later, verse 10 through 11, Jesus straightened up and asked the accused woman, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. The world tries to catch people in sin and label them for their wrongdoing. But Jesus extends forgiveness. He summarizes this interaction that he just had in verse 15. Talking to the Pharisees, he says, You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. Man, so if Jesus passes judgment on no one, not even the woman caught in adultery, who, by the way, there is nothing in that passage about her repenting, about her apologizing. She is just caught, and now she's standing accused. If Jesus extends forgiveness even to her, then, man, what place does judgment have in my heart or in my social media feed? Why would I use social media for anything other than to express forgiveness and hope and mercy? Good stuff to ponder, right? We're just pondering, right? We're just pondering. But Jesus did say that, right? Y'all read, did y'all read it in your Bible? Did he say that in your Bible? Man. Okay, y'all ready for my third theme? This one's going to take longer to communicate, but it's actually important. So try to hang with me. Try to track with me. And it's that if Jesus had social media, he would be a light rather than a shepherd. This one's sneaky, okay, because Jesus is both of these things. So, you know, I, I'm acknowledging that. So what I'm wondering is, who is he those things to, and how does he go about fulfilling those roles? And are there any implications we can read into? So who is he the light to? Jesus is the light of the world. We see several scriptures here that we wrote out. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but we'll have the light of life. The first one was John 3, 17. The next one's John 8, 12. In John 9, 5, he says, While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And in John 12, he says, I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes me should stay in darkness. So Jesus is a light of the world. He's a light to the world. And what does this mean? Like, what is that role, the light? It's a call to salvation. It's whoever believes in me, whoever follows me, it's, it's a beacon of hope. And how does he do this? I, I could go through these examples, but I, I won't. But he demonstrates who the Father is. He glorifies God, not just in the highlights, but also in difficulties. And he gives glimpses into his own relationship with God. And to the world means to anyone and everyone. Like, to him who has ears, let him hear. Like literally, crowds, people of different backgrounds, different beliefs. Like I will be a light to the whole world. I, do not, I am not here to condemn the world. I am here to save the world. I want to give the world hope, life, freedom through following me, salvation in me. Contrast that with Jesus as a shepherd. Who is Jesus a shepherd to? The answer is his flock. And what's interesting is not everyone is a part of Jesus' flock. John 10, starting in verse 24, the Jews gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. You do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Did y'all know that? Did y'all know that not everyone is a part of Jesus' flock? Similarly, controversially, but you can look it up, like not everyone is, quote unquote, a child of God. We're all made in God's image. But if you look biblically at that phrase, child of God, it is by faith in Jesus that we are adopted as children into God's family. We become children through our belief in Jesus. We become a part of the flock through our belief in Jesus. Jesus says, I am the gate for the sheep. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. There's this 
flock, and it is his people. It's the body of Christ, the family of God, those who are actively submitted to his lordship and leadership. That's the flock. And how does he shepherd? How does Jesus like to shepherd? He washes the disciples' feet in John 13. He explains the meaning of parables. He lays his life down. He cleanses. He directs. He protects against evil. He nourishes. He also entrusts authority and responsibility and holds people accountable and disciplines those he loves. He's like, he likes to shepherd close, intimate, sacrificial serving like a dad would for his kids, but way better. That's how he likes to shepherd. And how does he interact with people that aren't a part of his flock? Do we see him, like, begging for people to follow him? Do we see him, like, holding it against people for not following him or expecting non-believers to act like believers? I don't see those things. I see him moved by compassion, moved to compassion, seeing a crowd and saying, man, they're like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, I don't see him trying to shepherd people outside of his flock. I see him serving, loving, grieving, praying that they would join the flock. Man, I wish you were in a flock. Not, you need to go do that. Why are you doing that? He, does, he doesn't try to lead the lost as lost people. He tries to lead the lost to him so that he can really lead them, so that he can really shepherd them close. Y'all tracking with me so far? So, that's, so why do I say Jesus would be a light rather than a shepherd on social media? Because first of all, social media followers would not be equivalent to his true followers. His social media followers would be a mixed bag. Some of them would be his followers. Some of them would be his haters. <laughs> it would be a, a crowd of people. And because they are a crowd, therefore he would engage with them as a light to the world. They are representative of the world. He wouldn't use social media as an alternative for engaging in otherwise closer relationships. He would use it as a bridge to potentially closer relationships. Like, if that was the closest he could get to someone, maybe that's when Jesus would use social media. But that necessitates that it's his outer circle that he's talking to. It's the world that he's talking to. The second reason I think Jesus would be a light rather than a shepherd on social media is because the nature of social media is too distant for his way of shepherding. Like, even if he, let's say he was set his Instagram to private and only his 12 disciples were allowed to follow him, like, he still would not lead them on social media. Like, liking Peter's comment, it's not close to what Jesus wants to do as shepherd. You know, like, sending John a DM, like, it doesn't even scratch the surface of how Jesus shepherds. Like, could you imagine if I tried to lead my family on social media? Like, I don't live with my kids. I'm just like, hey, just follow me and do what I'm saying on my feed. Okay, like, that would be crazy. Have y'all ever, like, seen someone post something and feel like they're talking to you? Did you feel super loved that they were willing to reach out and to post that? Man, I'm so glad my boss just talked, generally speaking, about what people should do who work for people. Like, man, thank you for your leadership. No, you would feel offended and sad and like, why didn't he tell me? Like, Jesus would not lead on social media. He leads face-to-face, -face, close, impersonal. He's too loving, too intentional as a shepherd to let social media serve as a crutch for otherwise closer relationships. Like, he's not qualified to shepherd on social media because he there's not enough self-denial unto death. Like, I can't die well enough for my fault. I can't know them deeply enough, and I have to know them deeply. Like, that's how he shepherds. 
Anyone else thankful that Jesus pursues you, knows you personally, that he's, he's closer to you than a positivity post on your feed? Seriously, I think the implication for us is that we should do the same. So in John 14, 12, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. So he set an example that we should follow in his footsteps. Too often we go to social media to try to shepherd sheep that aren't a part of our flock and to distance ourselves emotionally from our actual shepherd and flock. We use social media to shepherd the world, influence the church, when we should be influencing the world and being shepherded by and shepherding within the church. In other words, like God's leadership is in the church, not in your pocket. He leads like this, not like this. So it's just a relational clarity that I'm hoping to express. Personally, I, in 2020, grieved a lot as it relates to social media. I'm a big picture thinker. I'm, I'm more concerned about, like, the state of the world than, like, someone has a problem with me. And so I was seeing trends on social media and, like, grieved and concerned. And, like, what do I do? Lord, they're acting like a bunch of sheep herd mentality like they think they're right because everyone else thinks like them but that's a terrible way to decide what's right like uh, I don't know what to do and internally I was getting mad like and I felt like God corrected me and like hey Jeremy like not everyone is a shepherd like I looked at the crowds and said man they're like sheep without a shepherd my desire is not for sheep to start acting like shepherds shepherds can't exist if there aren't sheep I made people to be shepherded. I'm not upset that they're not a shepherd. I'm upset that they don't have a shepherd after my heart to lead them, to serve them. And so I just started shifting my attention to like, okay, super practically, we've got anyone on your social media feed, you've got they're either a sheep or they're a shepherd or they're like not in the flock at all. And I felt like, man, I need to shepherd sheep that are in my flock, and I need to pray for shepherds for the sheep that are outside of my flock. I don't need to spend all my time trying to lead people that I'm not leading. So the nature of our audience on social media is a mixed bag. It is the world. It is not our flock. Our, my followers on social media, I am not the authority over their life. I asked a couple of our college students before church, I said, did you ever, have you ever felt like when I posted something on social media that I was talking to you, like it was really important for our college ministry that you like internalize and receive and apply what I said on social media? And they were like, no. I'm like, good. Because if I felt that, I would tell you. I would not post it and expect you to somehow ex like think that that's me talking to you. Like I'm, there is no authority on social media. Like, not Justin Bieber, not Cristiano Ronaldo, not Matt Chandler. Like, no, one on, no one's boss. No one is authority. No one is dad on social media. It is a pool of peers. It's brothers, sisters, strangers. And so, even if we mutually wanted there to be, like, if we in this room said, let's start a virtual church, and we'd pick who the leaders, all right, these accounts, they're the elders, these accounts, they're the the pastoral team, and these, yeah, okay, we have virtual church, we do it all on, on virtual, you know, virtual church, we can't, like, it's not sacrificial enough to be shepherding, we don't know them well enough to be shepherds, so what I'm saying is, like, this clarity of relational roles should matter for us, where it's not appropriate for us to act like a shepherd if I am actually a sheep, like, sheep don't need a big brother sheep to be inspired by. Sheep need a shepherd. If I am a sheep, it's not appropriate for me to act like a shepherd on social media. And I'm saying no one's a shepherd on social media. And even if I am a shepherd, one, that shepherding should be like Jesus' shepherding, 
close, personal, intimate, sacrificial, really truly knowing. And only for the sheep that are in his flock. If I am a shepherd, my shepherding shouldn't really be on social media. And it definitely shouldn't be trying to shepherd people that aren't a part of my flock. Are y'all tracking with me? It's like, I don't know if any of y'all as kids, maybe you wanted candy in your lunch that you got to take to school. And maybe your parents were like, no. I don't know if any of y'all were like, but so-and-so gets candy in their lunch. Their parent lets them stay up till 11. Anyone ever try that? I tried that. You know what my parents said? I'm not their parent. I'm your parent. Thank you for letting me know how their family operates. You know, like, like, social, like social media is like all the other parents. You know, like all these opinions. Okay, great. But, like, God's leadership involves people, not just opinions. I think you're tracking with me. <sighs> I think you are. So, so if we're wanting to lead people, it should be real people. Like, start with one disciple. Jesus led 12 people really, 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 really closely. And he died for them. If you want to lead someone, like, have some kids. <laughs> You know, <laughs> it's actually hard. <laughs> uh, make a disciple, lead a life group, plant a church, and see what leadership feels like. If you want to influence people, okay, but be a light to the world. We don't necessarily need a ton more influencers within the church. Okay, 1 Corinthians 3, let me just read this real quick. It's actually kind of like not that quick. But I am wrapping up my message. Don't worry. Let me get there. 1 Corinthians 3. So even if, like, what I'm saying right now, you're feeling like, okay, yeah, but I disagree because blank. Yeah, yeah, Jeremy's saying that, but I know so-and-so says this. I'm saying that's the mentality that is actually not healthy for us because we're just equating everyone to peers. It's a very social media mentality. Because so-and-so disagrees, or because I've read this and I know this, therefore I know I'm right. If you're the one that's deciding, then you're parenting yourself, which means you have no parent. Like if you are the one that agrees or disagrees, and therefore that's what's true or untrue, you're going to end up without any leaders. If you reject all the leadership over your life, you're going to end up without any leaders. And leaders, hopefully, are there to die for you, to protect you, to take care of you. Like, your life should be better if you grew up with parents than if you grew up on the streets. Even though several times they did things you didn't like, you know? And the parents have a responsibility to learn from other parents. Like, for you to say, so-and-so gets to stay up till 11. That's great that you shared that with them, and then they get to decide if that's going to change the way they parent you. Like, because so-and-so lets their kids stay up to 11 does not mean that, therefore, your parent is not your parent. <laughs> you know? Like, anyways. So 1 Corinthians 13, let's get, let's get spiritual. Okay, starting in 3, verse 18. Paul's saying, do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All things are yours, and you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. In other words, this church was like rejecting some of Paul's counsel and listing off all of these wisdoms. But have you read this book? Have you listened to this podcast? But I know this. But Apollo says that. Paul's like, look, I wish you were dumb. <laughs> like, you think you're so smart. I wish you didn't know anything like me. Because then you could actually be corrected by God. And by the way, I'm not trying to debate Apollos. I'm trying to lead you. He goes on. He says, so then, he said, yeah, no more boasting about men. No, who, no more boasting about what you've learned about who this or that person. 
in 4, verse 1, it says, So then, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. It's the Lord who judges me. That's awesome. He's like, look, I don't care if you think I'm right or wrong. I don't even know if I'm right or wrong. I think I'm right, but that doesn't even mean I am right. God's going to judge my life. Okay, so stop debating this right and wrong, this person or that person. He says, therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not take pride in one man over against another. For who makes you different from anyone else? What did you have that you did not receive? And if you did not receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Like, he's saying everything you learn that you think gives you the authority to just lead your own life by yourself in this pool of brothers and sisters. What did you learn that you didn't learn? You learned it, so why are you acting like you know it? You didn't create the truth yourself. If you really were concerned with a truth, you would want it to be a benefit to the whole body, not just a defense mechanism for you to live your own independent life. He says, already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have become kings, and that without us. How I wish you really had become kings so that we might be kings with you. Wow, you're so great. You're so right. Look at all those things you've got. You must be right. I wish you were really, really were right. And then you could tell us what was right. But you're not actually interested in telling me what's right. You're interested in us leaving you alone. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are so strong. You are honored, but we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. Or, uh, it says, another translation, even if you had 10,000 teachers in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. Or let me say it this way. Even though you have 10,000 influencers, even though you listen to 10,000 podcasts, even though you follow 10,000 people, you do not have many fathers. Okay, I really am about done, but on the receiving end, how is God leading me? He's not just leading you to aggregate the information from 10,000 people. I would rather personally have one father than 10,000 teachers. I need one person who will die with me and for me, who will care for me enough to correct me, who will teach me and shape me and mold me. I don't need 10,000 more opinions. And So on the receiving end, just because so-and-so said such-and-such doesn't mean that such-and-such is right. And just because I said such-and-such doesn't mean that I'm right. The heart is, are we a part of the flock? Or are we trying to use, like, voices to distance ourselves from the flock? And so that's what we don't want to do. But what I'm saying that we do get to do is be a light to the world. Be a light to the world. It is appropriate and good and right for us to be a message of hope and forgiveness for the lost. Jesus calls us believers, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We're meant to serve as his ministers, reconciling people to him, demonstrating his love and character, testifying of his goodness, representing him rightly, 
being moved by compassion for people to know him, praying that people might join the flock, praying that laborers might go to those without shepherds, that they might be represented to, serving as little Christs, which literally means little Christians. Or, yeah, Christian means little Christ. So if we are Christians, let's be little Christ. And if Christ is who we want to emulate, then we have to consider how does he interact with the world. And I'm submitting to you guys, it's as a light, not as a voice of condemnation. And it's a call to join the flock, not to try to lead the non-flock. And how does he interact with his flock? It's here, not there. It's the person across the table from you in coffee or in your home, not the person with the opinion. And if you come across a person with an opinion that you think would be helpful for this, then you should bring it here, not just repost it there. And if you see a person that's a person that is responsible for other people and they say something you disagree with, you shouldn't just post something and hope they read it. You should call that person. I did this in May 2020, back when you weren't allowed to post a picture with you and your mom because you're not allowed to be next to anybody in May. No pictures of people in March, April, and May. Seriously. So a person was sharing some things that I thought was concerning, and he represents a lot of people. And so I sent him a voice message and said, hey, you posted some things I'm concerned about because you represent a lot of people. And I don't know if you know what you're saying because I think what you're saying might not be what you're trying to say. You know what he said? Forget you. And then added me on a, no, he said, thank you so much. I feel loved like a brother. And his post got way better after that, way more constructive and helpful for all the lost and all the people of God. Okay, so if you really have a problem, like, talk to someone, you know? And if you're talking to someone that you don't actually know, then let it be to the world as a light, not as a leadership, correction, instruction, discipline. Okay. Band, you guys can come on up. I would love for y'all to read in John 12. I feel like Jesus um, really like resembles a lot of these values really clearly in verse 19 through verse 36. Sorry I'm in your way, Victor. Should I get down? Are you okay? Victor and I are thinking about starting a fashion brand called Stature. <laughs> if you're a male taller than 5'9", we make nothing for you. Okay. <laughs> Short guys only. Uh, nothing fits out there. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> verse 19. Starting through verse 36. The Pharisees are complaining, first of all, and they say, look, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Like, the whole world is wanting to see Jesus. He is a light. Like, Jesus would probably have more <laughs> followers than any of us, and we would be offended that he's being some type of, like, world pleaser person. You know, like, he would probably be rebuked by most of the church for how much he engages with the lost in a way that we think is leading people astray, even though his heart is not even to lead people other than to lead them to salvation so that he can really lead them. And then this epic stuff happens. Jesus is like, the hour has come for me to die. He says, what? Now my heart is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. That he's promoting God rather than himself. And he says, now it is time for judgment on this world. There's that word, judgment. I knew he was a judge. He says, now the prince of this world will be driven out. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge the world by getting the devil out of here. But I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? He doesn't hold it against them that they don't see that he's the one he's talking about. But he continues to extend forgiveness even on the cross. He says, Father, forgive them. 
not Father, show them how stupid they are for doing this to me. Father, let my sacrifice be a heap of burning coals on their head. No, he says, Father, forgive them. Man, if they knew who I was, they would have never done this. <laughs> they would have never done this if they knew, what I, knew who I was. But I don't hold it against them. I want them to know who I am. And then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. The man who walks in the dark does not know where he is going. Put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may become sons of light. Not only is he light, but he invites us to be children of light, to share in this mission, to be a part of this ministry that he's, he started of reconciling the world to himself. So a couple thoughts I want to leave us with. Promote God instead of self. Let Jesus be the main character. Let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven, not so that you receive glory. Forgive, don't judge. Don't throw stones. Don't partner with our world's culture of accusation and pride based on associations and disassociations. And if it's a member of your own flock you have a concern with, talk to them directly. And lastly, be a light rather than a shepherd. Display the character of God vulnerably and radically as a way to reach the lost and influence them to know him, not as a way to lead. If you want to lead, make a disciple. My challenge for y'all as we walk away, we're just going to worship God, thank him that he is awesome. My social media feed is not a perfect example of everything I'm communicating. I'm just trying to communicate some things I see about Jesus in John 8 through 14, and I think it has some implications to how we engage with the lost and with his people. My challenge for y'all is to think of at least one person to let go of and at least one person to hold on to. If you just imagine in your mind's eye anyone and everyone that you've interacted with or seen a post of that's gotten your blood boiling, that's made you frustrated, that's hurt your feelings, think of at least one person that actually is not a part of your flock, actually maybe isn't even in any flock, maybe they're not a believer, period. And maybe instead of trying to get them to understand something, maybe there's an invitation from God to let go of that person and to pray that God would send a shepherd to that person. And one person to hold on to. Maybe someone that instead of hoping they come to know something or wishing they would read something, maybe someone you could actually reach out to. You're allowed to do that, just so you know. Send a, hey, I saw you posted this. It's not like a fake world. It's not another life. It's, that's a real person. And maybe there's a person that you know of that you could actually, like, step into, lean into, to be a part of shepherding, of leading, or of influencing at least, instead of just kind of viewing their life from a, from a distance when you could be seeing it up close. So I'm going to pray. We're going to spend some time worshiping God who is the light of the world who, and who is the shepherd of our souls. But Jesus, I thank you that you are a great, great, great shepherd. God, we can't do anything apart from you, and we don't even know what you would do if you were in this world. Um, but we know that you love the world, that you did not come to condemn the world. The point of you coming to earth was not to overwhelm the world with its sinfulness, but to, but to give it a hope, to give it a savior. And I thank you that the freedom from sin, the alignment into your character, the, the knowing of truth, it all comes from following you. And so, God, I pray that it would be on our hearts for people to follow you, that we would see our feed, we would see news, we would see the world, and not just get mad at the world being the world, but that we would, we would cry out, God, would people know you for who you really are? Would they follow you? Would they be ones who have seen the light, who walk in light? And God, I pray that we'd promote you, that we wouldn't be infatuated with ourselves. And look what I've done. But we would say, you are the God who's been with me and who always will be with me. I've received nothing except what's been given to me from you. And so let me glorify you in private and in public, regardless of what I'm put out of in the process. I thank you, God.